Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'd like to invite those of you still on the floor to come in and join us for worship. Our call to worship today comes from Psalm 138. May all the kings of the earth praise you, Lord, when they hear what you have decreed. May they sing the ways of the Lord, for the glory of the Lord is great. Please stand and join us in worship this morning.
You guys may be seated. Well, welcome to Christ Church. My name is John. I'm the pastor of Christ Church, and we are a strategic partner of Grace Chapel in Lexington, and we are on a mission to celebrate people, pursue wholeness, and discover God. If this is your first time visiting with us today, we're really glad that you're here, and we want to encourage you to uh, take some time after service and fill out one of our visitors' cards so that we can know how to pray for you and get to know you a little bit better. We have a gift at the Welcome Center for you once you turn one of these in as well. A lot of things going on at Christ Church. Uh, first, uh, next week, we will have an important congregational meeting after the service. Uh, some items will be introduced that are voting, m- voting matters for members. We won't be voting that Sunday, but we encourage members to attend and really anybody who's able to attend as well is welcome. Uh, secondly, the Nathan Project benefit and celebration is coming up on March 9th from 6.30 to 9 p.m. Um, Nathan Project is an important partner of Christ Church that helps men who are struggling with pornography, and we're really excited to be uh, working alongside of them, and um, Rick and Vicki Cardos, and they've just done an amazing work throughout southern New Hampshire. So we're so fortunate that God has blessed us with them and blessed, continues to bless people all around the state through them, and this is their annual, con- this is their annual banquet, and we really encourage you to attend. It's a, great, it's a great date night. I can attest from last year that the food is great, so we'll be hearing from some key speakers at that event, and uh, that's coming right up, so we encourage, you to, uh, we encourage you to sign up for that, and you can learn more about that at the Welcome Center. We have uh, special guests Andrew and Jessica Locke, Greta Volkenstein, and Doug and Teresa Bevins, who will be sharing with us that night. And Rick and Vicki wanted me to let you know that they, they tried to send out snail mail invitations to you also. They apologize if they didn't, weren't able to do that. Um, you are all invited to that and encouraged to attend as well. Uh, thirdly, our safety training uh, will be happening after service. So uh, as soon as we end, we encourage you to move fellowship out into the foyer so that people can come in here and begin the safety training. Uh, We will be having people from other churches coming to kind of hear our plan so that they can use our ideas to maybe help them prepare for a safer environment as well, and people from the community as well. So again, after service, we just invite you to move fellowship out into the foyer right away. And I just just wanted to make a a note um, and acknowledge the passing of Billy Graham this week. Billy Graham had an immense impact on Christianity that's hard to measure. But really, just a few things stand out about, about who this man was. He was a man of integrity, and he was a man of integrity to the end. And that's hard to say for a lot of famous preachers and teachers in Christianity, as sad as it is to say that. He had an immense impact in encouraging us to get back to the Bible and, and learn about the Jesus from Scripture and, and be faithful to that. And he transformed untold lives. He, he, had, he had friendships with presidents on both sides of the aisles and world leaders, and usually when, when I was growing up anyways, you, when you would mark the three holiest people, it would be like the Pope, Mother Teresa, and Billy Graham would be right up there. Christianity today is, has been marked and shaped by this man. So um, in many ways, his passing this week at 99 was the end of an era. And we can only hope that God will raise up more men like Billy Graham. So I just wanted to acknowledge that today for those of you who didn't know and and, and just thank God for um, the work that Billy Graham did for us. Let's continue worship. So we're continuing our brokenness series this week. And um, one area I really find that I struggle with a lot in my life, and I feel like a lot of us do, is, um, is a religious insincerity or like an insincerity in our faith. Um, you know, we talk about it a lot, but is the person that shows up to work on Monday morning the same person that's sitting here on Sunday singing praise and worship, you know? And I know for me that's definitely not always the case. Um, we're going to be spending some time in the book of Amos today going over um, and just reflecting on, on these things. If you would all read Amos 5 with me. I hate, I despise your religious festivals. Your assemblies are a stench to me. Even though you bring me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. Though you bring choice fellowship offerings, I will have no regard for them. Away with the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the music of your harps. 
but let justice roll on like a river, righteousness like a never-ending stream. I kind of some harsh words, um, but it just goes to show how important it is to God that we are sincere in what we do. So we would like to share with you um, just a special piece of music to get our hearts and our minds ready to receive the message today.
Father, we just pray that this morning we wouldn't sing empty songs to you. We wouldn't be insincere in our faith, but just that we would be a people, though broken, willing to love and to show your love, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we continue our series on uh, brokenness, I, uh, I just want to remind you of something that Pastor Brian shared at the beginning of our series, especially as we dig into the minor prophets, which we all hope that you'll gain some minor profit from. <laughs> no. I stole that from Dave Ripper. So if you hear that later, yeah. Um, um, Pastor Brian reminded us that prophets are a little bit different than pastors because prophets, they step into situations so they, they, they kind of uh, break things and, and raise trouble and tell everybody what's wrong with everybody, and then they kind of leave town. Uh, pastors are there to clean things up <laughs> and uh, nurture and encourage. Uh, Paul reminds us in his, uh, many of his letters, but in, especially in his letter to 2 Corinthians, that pastors, and, and himself included, came to build up and not to tear up. So uh, I just, uh, I'm just asking you for a little bit of permission today to uh, break a few things. <laughs> And to, uh, to rattle cages just a little bit as we dig into the prophets to honor, honor the, uh, the feeling that the prophets are trying to accomplish in their letters. Well, last week at the men's retreat, uh, we opened up with an icebreaker, with an icebreaker question. What's the most embarrassing thing that you did in your 20s? Now, I'm not going to share you what I shared there. And <laughs> And I'm not going to share with you what uh, the other guys shared as well, because what happens at the men's retreat stays at the men's retreat. Amen. Amen. <laughs> but it got me thinking of embarrassing moments in my life, and I was thinking about one when I was about seven. It wasn't an embarrassing moment because of something foolish that I did or something foolish that happened to me. It was, it was a different kind of embarrassing altogether. I was seven, and uh, I looked up to my dad, as most seven-year-olds do. My dad was a traveling salesman. He, he sold big farm equipment, so he would load my little sister and I into his Dodge truck and, and pull a giant 40-foot trailer with some big piece of farm equipment that would attach to the back of a tractor that I didn't really understand at the time, and I still don't. But he would drive all over the Midwest and state to state and show up at these dealerships and and try to share his pitch with these guys and convince them that this is the best, best equipment that they need for the job. And as kids do, we look up to our dads who are, who are bigger than life to us. I always thought that my dad kind of had the facial structure of, of Harrison Ford. So he was like Indiana Jones or, or Han Solo. You know, I wanted to be like him, and I definitely wanted to be accepted by him. So I remember one time in particular as we drove into some state I don't remember, uh, we were out in the dealer lot and I was probably just digging my shoes in the gravel, kind of waiting, the, waiting for my dad to finish his pitch so that we could go home. And, and I felt this urge. I, uh, I, instead of going up to him and tugging on his arm and saying what I usually said, can we go yet? Can we go yet? I wanted to, I wanted to jump in on the pitch. <laughs> I, I didn't know what my dad was pitching, but I, I heard him say it enough that I thought, maybe I can help him out. Maybe I can be proud. And so I waited for, the, uh, I waited for my dad to take a breath, 
And I said something. I don't remember what I said. And I, I don't remember it very well. The dealer might have looked down at me and then just looked up. He might not have even looked at me at all. My dad didn't look down at me. He just continued his way on his way with his pitch. And, and I felt invisible. I just felt invisible. I remember that feeling. And it wasn't that my dad didn't care about me. Maybe my dad didn't even hear me at the time. But I felt invisible, and I just wanted to be accepted by my dad. You know, what's interesting is I reflect upon this principle. And I even see it in the lives of other people. Some of my adult friends who've had tumultuous relationships with their dads. Even people who have negative relationships with their dads. There's something deep down inside of them that wants to be accepted by their fathers. It drives people. Even when their fathers pass away, even when negative fathers pass away, there's something sometimes in us that wants to keep striving to do these things that we know would please our fathers, and there's part of us that even hates it if it was a negative relationship. That's true, I believe. That principle is true for our relationship with our Heavenly Father as well. We, we want to be accepted by our Father in heaven. There's something built into us that has that desire. But we struggle because part of us puts our religious practice only into practice at certain times and certain days of the week. We, we box off certain areas so that we can do things that maybe deep down we know wouldn't please our Father. And then at other times we do religious things like attend a worship service on Sunday. And, and there, there's, there's part of us sometimes that feels a little bit divided because we box up our life. We, we put things into different boxes. And, and our practices sometimes on Monday don't reflect our desire to, to experience the acceptance of our Heavenly Father on Sunday. Amos says some pretty profound things in his book about that idea. And in Amos 5.18, he says this. It's something that Christians generally long for and hope for, something called the day of the Lord when Jesus will return. Well, Amos says this to the Israelites, woe to those who wish for the day of the Lord. Why do you want the, why do you want the Lord's day of judgment to come? It will bring darkness, not light, he says in Amos 5.18. In another place, Amos says this, Prepare to meet your God, Israel. But he doesn't mean the good kind of meat there. Because the Israelites were, they were doing something different on Sunday than they were on Monday. They wanted the acceptance of the Father. They wanted to please their Father, but they, they lived a divided life. And because of their religious practice on Sunday, they were blinded to the inconsistencies of their way of life on Monday. We want the Father's acceptance. We want our Heavenly Father's acceptance, but we, but we struggle. We struggle with religious insincerity. We, we struggle to be true. How can we live the kind of life that we know at the end of time when we meet Jesus and we meet the Father, we're going to know that he's glad to see us. We're going to experience his acceptance deep down inside of us. And Amos is going to answer that very question for us today. So if you have your Bibles with me, I'd love for you to open up to the book of Amos. The book of Amos. Amos is writing in about the time of the 8th century BC, about eight centuries before Jesus arrived on the scene. And uh, just to kind of paint a little bit of a picture of what was going on at that time in Israel, the kingdom was divided. It was divided between north and south. In the north, they called the tribes, that, uh, the northern tribes, they called that Israel. And in the south, they called those tribes Judah after the biggest and largest and primary tribe. So you had Israel in the north and you had Judah in the south. These these kingdoms, they split apart after the Davidic monarchy. And there was always fighting and disagreement between the two. But Israel was probably in the worst position of all because they more quickly adopted idolatrous practices. 
and let evil in their midst. You see, God, he had decided that his sanctuary, his temple, and his presence was going to dwell in Jerusalem, in the temple at Jerusalem. Well, when the Israelites split off, they didn't have a Jerusalem, so they decided, well, we're going to set up our own temples, our own, our own altars without God's permission. They did it in the northern part called Dan. They did it in a place called Bethel. That's a place that Amos is going to visit as we look through the book later. So they set up these shrines, these false sanctuaries, and God wasn't happy about it. This was a wealthy time for the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. They both were very prosperous, but that doesn't mean that God was happy. So he commissioned a prophet named Amos. Famous Amos. (laughs) Well, Amos... Amos actually wasn't a prophet to begin with. As we open the book, we learn that he was a herdsman. He wasn't a normal shepherd. It uses a different word for shepherd there, a herdsman. And he also probably owned property because later in the book, in chapter 7, we learned that he took care of sycamore trees. Well, there were no sycamore trees where Amos was from in Tekoa, so he probably owned land somewhere else. Amos had a good job, in other words. Why would you dump what you're doing, and why would you go and be a prophet somewhere else? And why, did, why was the author interested in including that detail? Well, we're going to find out in a little bit. It's actually pretty important to Amos' story. But I want you to just, for a minute, just put yourself in Amos' sandals. Let's try to picture what he's feeling a little bit. He lives in Tekoa. It's about 10 miles south of Jerusalem. Bethel, where he's commissioned to go and share his prophecy to Israel is about another 10 miles north of Jerusalem. So we're talking about a day's journey to Jerusalem and then probably another day's journey to Bethel where he's commissioned to prophesy. He's probably going to stop in Jerusalem on his way to get rest, to rejuvenate. And as he's walking along and he's thinking, God, I'm not a trained prophet. In the text, it says he isn't a son of a prophet. And that's probably a figure of speech to show that he didn't go to a prophetic school. Not that prophetic schools were bad, they're good. But for some reason, God chose to pick him out of the the regular working class and just send him to be a prophet instead. And you can imagine that he's feeling a little bit of anxiety. They're not going to accept me, especially as he steps into Jerusalem and he looks at all of these religious folk around here and all these trained priests. He's like... God, are you sure that uh, that I'm the right guy for this? But Amos, he he rests on it. He he sleeps overnight in Jerusalem, probably, and then he he begins his trek to Bethel the next day through through wilderness, through rocky terrain that probably wouldn't be unlike some places in in New Hampshire with uh, olive trees along the way, sparsely populated, but, but no good place to hide. So a second fear starts to enter Amos' heart. And he is starting to think, well, (laughs) I'm going into Israel now. So they may not accept me as a prophet, but they're not going to accept me because I'm from Judah. And we aren't on good terms. He's probably scouting places to hide along the way, and they're just, it just doesn't look like there's any good place to hide. Just in case somebody comes alongside him and asks him, Where are you from, partner? You don't look like you're around these parts. (laughs) Eventually, he makes his way, and he gets to Bethel, where the altar's at, and where there's a priest named Amaziah. And he has a message for Amaziah. He has a message for the entire people of Israel. Some of the smells are the first thing that probably stood out to Amos. He smells the smells of a barbecue, now, when we smell the smells of a barbecue, we think, hey, lunchtime, yeah, church party afterwards or something like that. But for, the, for Amos, the smells of a barbecue signaled something different. He remembered those smells from Jerusalem because of the sacrifices. They were more of a religious smell than a suppertime smell. Well, probably a little bit of both, but that religious smell, it would have been like us smelling incense or something like that. This is a very religious place, a very special place. But he starts to feel queasy because he knows that the sacrifices are not supposed to take place at Bethel. They're supposed to take place at Jerusalem. This altar with blood stained along its sides, that's not supposed to be here. So he feels a little nervous and not easy about even being there. 
It would be like us, some of us maybe seeing a Buddhist monk or a statue and, or going into a, a Hindu temple and seeing them worship some of the statues. It, that doesn't feel quite right, and it didn't feel quite right to him. So three strikes, Amos probably wants to get out of there. But he announces his entrance, and Amaziah says, okay, we have a prophet here. We're going to accept him in. And Amos goes and shares his message, probably very, very nervous about it. He's not ready to share it. He's not, he doesn't know what to share, maybe, in some aspects. But God does two surprising things. He does two surprising things to prepare Amos for the message. And really, he, he does three things. The first thing that he does is he calls out, not Israel, but Israel's neighbors, he says about Damascus, they treated the Gileads violently, so they're going to be judged. He says about Gaza, which is where the Philistines were at, those uncircumcised Philistines, they were selling slaves to Edom. They're going to be judged too. How about Tyre? They were selling slaves to Edom also. And you think Edom's going to get off? Nope. Edom bought those slaves. Ammon, they ripped open Gilead's pregnant women to expand their territories. God is coming after them. Moab, Moab desecrated the king of Edom. And last but not least, Judah, where I come from, Amos says, your brother whom you despise. They rejected the law and they dipped into idolatry. We see this in the first two chapters. Amos doesn't go after Israel. He goes after everybody else. And Amaziah, this priest sitting in Bethel, he's probably thinking, you know what? I like this guy. I can get into this. Let's, let's keep going. Let's hear some more. For us, it would be similar if uh, you know, we said, God came to us or Amos came to us with a message from God and he said, how about North Korea? In North Korea, they starve their own people. They threaten the world with nuclear destruction. Their day of reckoning is coming near. ISIS, they've dehumanized women. They have slaughtered innocents. They will meet God, not in the good way. How about Hollywood? Well, Hollywood is preached against injustice and looked down on religious people. Right now, God is judging them for the abuse that they've allowed in their midst. Politicians, <laughs> the swamp, we, people like to call them, they say that they were from the people, but um, they've pocketed money from the corporations. Uh, their greed will be exposed. And we like that kind of thing. I mean, kind of. It's like, yeah, finally, somebody's standing up for the little guy. We're tired of this, you know, the way that the world is. Justice needs to be done. But then something changes. After, well, first, what Amos is, God is leading Amos to do here is he's leading them to stir up hatred in their heart for injustice. And they can, they can recognize the injustice of these other nations. And we can recognize the injustice of the other people around us, of other countries, of, of other groups of people. We can recognize it and we can feel in our hearts hatred for the things that they do. We can feel hatred for abortion. We can feel hatred for sex trafficking. We can feel that. And you know, we should feel that because those things are wrong. That's the first thing that Amos does. But he doesn't stop there. In 3 1, he changes the tune. And he says, You know what, Israel? You are not off the hook. God has something against you. He says this specifically Listen, you Israelites, to this message which the Lord is proclaiming against you. Amaziah was on the edge of his seat. And now he sits back and he folds his arms. Probably something like this. Okay. What do you got for me? Well, Israel, as I said, was prosperous. And one of the things that God says in this prophecy is that he's going to destroy their summer houses and their winter houses. He's going to take away their beds decorated with ivory. 
But their wrong was not that they were wealthy. Their wrong was how they got their wealth. Let's look at these list of verses together. In Amos 4.1, he says, You oppress the poor. You crush the needy. In Amos 8.4, he says this, Listen to this, you who trample the needy and do away with the destitute in the land. In Amos 8, 5, he says, We're eager to sell less for a higher price and cheat the buyer with rigged sales. In Amos 5, 11, he says, They make the poor pay taxes on their crops and exact a grain tax from them. In 5, 12, You torment the innocent. You take bribes and you deny justice to the needy at the city gate. The city gate was where they did, where where the courts met to to settle matters and settle disputes. And then finally in 5.10, the Israelites hate, let me say that word again, the Israelites hate anyone who arbitrates at the city gate. They despise anyone who speaks honestly. Well, that's a powerful thing because what God led Amos to say and what God led Amos to help these Israelites feel is hatred towards injustice in the world. And now he says, you Israelites, you hate, but you hate justice. You hate justice. Mm. Well, the Israelites were religious people. They met on Sunday They didn't practice what they preached on Sunday on Monday, though. And so this is what God says to them. He says, you know what? Stop wearing your Sunday best because of how you're living on Monday, because of your Monday worst. In 5.5, he says, don't seek Bethel. That's where one of the altars was at. Do not visit Gilgal. That's where another altar was at. Do not journey down to Beersheba. It's where another altar was at. Don't do that anymore. Because what you preach is not consistent with the way you live. And then he says this in 5.1. Listen to this funeral song. I am ready to sing about you, family of Israel. Now, <laughs> we like to have songs sung about us, right? Love songs, ballads of our bravery, Nobody wants a funeral dirge sung over them. That's bad news. (laughs) This is not good. It is not good for Israel. So first, he helps them to experience hatred for injustice, and then Amos exposes their injustice as well. But he doesn't stop there, because God doesn't want them to have an excuse. And this is something very interesting that happens. You can imagine... Amaziah is sitting here, and you have this prophet coming in. And, and when we are exposed, we become defensive. We start to, we start to justify our actions. And, and maybe Amaziah was thinking, well, we didn't make them poor. Maybe it was their choices that made them poor. Sure, you know, we taxed them a little bit heavily, and sure, we did this, but we didn't make them poor. And then he comes to this. But who are you? Amos, Uh, everybody does this. You ever hear that excuse? Everybody does it. Everybody does it, so it's okay. Uh, Even you, Amos. Amaziah thinks that he has Amos in his trap because prophets, normally we find out in Amos, they went to school and they were paid for their prophecies. So Amaziah says this, In 7 verse 12, he says this to Amos. Leave, you visionary. Run away to the land of Judah. Earn your living and prophesy there instead. Go earn your living there. I got you. You're just here to make a profit. And you're you're accusing us for wanting to make a profit too? Well, this is where God beat Amaziah to the punch. God didn't call Amos to be a special prophet because God didn't call Amos, who was a herdsman, to be a prophet without going to school because he wanted to teach us that that God can use anybody, and God can use anybody. God called Amos to be a prophet 
who was a herdsman, so that he would be free from the accusation of Amaziah, who said he was just doing this to earn a living. Amos is like, nope, <laughs> look, I was well off before I came. I, 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 all of my needs were met. So you can't accuse me of coming here and trying to make a dime off of you guys. The same thing that you guys are trying to do to the poor. I had a, I had a hard time with this message because when I think about how, when I think about CCA, when I think about our church and our church family and, and what it does, or, or even when I think about Amos, and when I want to be really faithful to what Amos is saying and what he's not, because I think it's really tempting to take Amos in, in several different directions and say things that, um, that we think he's saying, but he's, he's really not saying at all. Um, for instance, it would be easy to say that Amos is about the injustice of poverty. Amos isn't about the injustice of poverty. It's about people who were abusing the poor. Um, Amos is it's not about giving to the poor, although we should, and that's true, but that's not what this book is dealing with or addressing. It's, uh, it's about taking advantage of poor people. Amos is not about how God can use anybody to speak. And he can use anybody to speak. But the reason he chose a shepherd was to, throw, was, to, was to remove any excuse that Amaziah and the Israelites might have when they were receiving this message. So it's not about the idea that anybody, God can use anybody to speak. And finally, Amos is not about calling injustices out in others. Even though that happens here, it's about the injustice that we harbor in our midst it's not about going over there and saying, you're unjust, you're unjust. It's about looking inward and seeing our own injustices. I struggled with that because when I, when I look at CCA, my belief and my hope for our church family is that there is not many among us who are mechanics who break something extra in order to get another charge. My hope and belief about CCA is there are uh, not many among us who are part of pyramid schemes, although I see that from Christians more and more who, who, who gain money from the top by, by the trickle-down effect and, pouring and, and, and making, keeping the poor poor and utilizing the people underneath them to, to take and, and reap the benefits. Uh, I hope and I believe that not many of us are payday lenders where we abuse uh, the poor who are in a difficult situation and charge exorbitantly high interest rates. And I believe and, and I hope that not many here, if hopefully no one at CCA is a televangelist, <laughs> that sells snake oil in order to bankrupt older people and keep their, their, uh, their private fleet of jets sustained. I hope that there's not many, and I, I don't believe that there is. In fact, on the contrary, you know, when I look at our church family, I see people in our church family who have reached out to the poor, who have opened up their homes to the poor, and who have met the needs of the poor. I, I see that happening privately. I see that happening. I see that, I see that as a decision that we've made as a church to, to partner with, with ministries like single parents in, in need or or safe families. We do it publicly. We meet the needs of the poor privately. So I hope that, and I believe that by and large, we are not a church that abuses the poor. That's why I had a hard time with this message, because what does God have to say to us through Amos? Well, I think the heart of what's going on is the same and true for us. We may not abuse the poor, but all of us, at one time or another, we've used people. And we use people. Let me share this story from you from a former pastor, senior pastor of Grace Chapel and chancellor of Denver Seminary, Gordon McDonald. He shares this story in a leadership journal. There was a woman in our congregation, Catherine, 50 or so, who was easy to overlook and, frankly, even avoid. Most of the time, she was 
in a highly medicated state due to various issues related to severe depression. Catherine seemed to have no opinions that anyone cared to hear. She appeared to have no abilities that anyone might find useful. And she certainly wasn't financially capable of making a noticeable contribution in the church's revenue budget. One moment, Catherine entered the room and and Gordon waved and half-heartedly shouted, Hello, Catherine. How are you? And then Gordon turned back to the conversation that he was having uh, with the staff member at the time. A couple minutes later, Catherine came up to him and said in a monotone, medicated voice that he never forgot, Pastor Mac. Each word seemed to... uh, each word seemed to slowly be slowly and deliberately spoken. Pastor Mac, you say, hello, Catherine, how are you? But you really don't want to know. You don't have time to know. You only want to be with important people. But we not so important people are the ones who need you the most. Gordon writes this, I can easily argue that Catherine was simply manipulating me and that it was not mine as the lead pastor of a megachurch to feel responsible for her, but I can can also argue that Catherine was correct, that she was simply saying what a lot of other people were thinking, but were reluctant to say themselves. If you're going to be a pastor... There is no ordinary, thank you C.S. Lewis, people. But I want to take that a step further. If you are going to be a Christian, there are no ordinary people. There are no ordinary people. In ministry, it is so easy to look at people as numbers, to fill seats or to fill our Bible studies instead of human beings who have a story and have a life. It's easy to just uh, count who showed up. How many did we get this Sunday? Or it's easy to gravitate towards people with resources or people who have influence. It's really easy to do that. It's It's easy to just gravitate towards people in church that are just like us, that are just in our stage of life, our our marital status, and that easily leaves people on the fringes kind of left out. Even in a church as hospitable as Christ Church, it's easy to be left out. It's easy for that to happen in the public square, and I am so guilty of this. I feel terrible about it. But when I'm in the checkout line, sometimes I treat that checkout person no differently than I would if I'm at the robot scanning myself. I don't look up. They're not a person. They don't need to be. They're just a transaction. Now, I'm not saying that I need to have this deep conversation with the checkout person and ask them about their deepest life challenges. That would get the security person over probably in a real hurry. But do I acknowledge them as a person and just appreciate the the brief moment that I might have to value them and to see them for who they are? We do that as parents. We look at our children and we sometimes feel disappointed as they crawl into their teens and they don't meet the dream that we had for them or the dream that we were never able to fulfill. So we experience this disappointment and this disillusionment because it's we use them, it's about our dreams, and instead of being about their dreams, we do this as children. I think especially as we grow up into adulthood and we experience enough maturity to make decisions for ourselves, we look at our parents as paychecks, as places to stay, as places to go get another meal, and we never ask them about their stories. They have a story. They have interests. They have dreams. We do this as spouses. When time goes by and it becomes more about just what they did for me or what they didn't do for me, that transaction balance instead of about loving and caring and meeting their needs and the responsibility that we have to cherish them and love them for for who they are. So God is not happy. So God is not happy. About eight centuries later, Jesus is going to show up on the scene and he's... 
going to make a big difference in the world because he was pinned to a cross and he paid for the sins of the world. That's what 1 John 2, 2 says. It does, doesn't say, 1 John 2, 2 says that Jesus died to pay for not only our sins, but the sins of the whole world. So because of that, God's relationship with us turned from enemy to friend. His love extended forward and embraced us, the scripture says, while we were still his enemies. The offer, the, all of the sins of the world that will ever be committed and that have ever been convi- committed have been paid for on the cross. But not everybody will embrace that. And not everybody will take that reality. So when Paul says in 2 Corinthians seven thirteen that godly sorrow leads to repentance, which leads to salvation, we can't skip a step. The word repentance means change. Godly sorrow, if we're really sorry about it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to lead to a change. And that's going to lead to the day when we meet God face to face and we will be glad instead of sad because we will see that he has accepted us. So even though this sounds Old Testament, there is still a true principle for us after the cross that if we don't truly embrace the cross and realize that that true godly sorrow leads to change, we will not see a glad father. At the end, at the end. So the verse and the question, how do we become the kind of people that we can, be, that we can confidently know that God is going to accept, our heavenly father will accept us at the end? The answer is in Hosea 5.15. Hosea 5.15. Hate evil, love good, maintain justice in our courts. Perhaps the Lord God Almighty will have mercy on the remnant of Joseph. Hate evil and love good in you, in us, among us. That feeling that you get when you hear about another mass shooting when you hear about the Parkland situation, when you hate that evil and you're sick and you're tired of it, that feeling that you get when you hear about another predator abusing some young girl, that feeling that you get deep down in your core, that's a good feeling to have. But not just towards them, towards the things inside our hearts when we use people, even if they seem like relatively trivial Ways. Those are good things to experience. Hate evil. Love. Love good. And our Heavenly Father, He He will accept us on that last day. This is hard. This is not easy. That's our why our series is is uh, broken, right? Because because we are a broken people, but we have we have so much hope because of the grace of God has the grace of God has extended to us. Uh, I want to take our, our last moment and uh, just uh, take a moment of quiet as I invite the worship team to come up. I just want to take the next sixty seconds to just reflect on the ways that we have used people and ask for God's mercy and grace to step in, and we'll we'll pray we'll pray a prayer of confession together. I love celebrate people. I love that that's our mission because when we say that every Sunday, it's a challenge. It's a challenge for us to see the value in every person and to say every person matters. No, we can't realistically, we cannot expect ourselves to have a deep relationship with, with every person that we ever encounter or meet, but we can, we can care Say this with me. 
Lord, as our hearts break for the injustices in the world, let our hearts break over the injustices in our own lives. Uncover our blind spots. Help us to see the value people the way you see and value people. Forgive us for using people, Lord. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand as we close the service. Refuge for the poor, a shelter from the storm, this is our God. He will wipe away your tears and return your wasted years, this is our God. So call upon his name. He is mighty to save, this is our God. Father to the orphan, a healer to the broken, this is our God. He brings peace to all. Lord and Savior, Jesus.
Jesus, Lord and Savior, Jesus, Lord. As we go ahead and close our service today, we want to invite you to do a few things. First, we want to invite you to give. We have an offering box on the way out, or you can give online at ccnh.org. God says in his scripture that he loves cheerful givers, so we, can, we ask that you would consider doing that today. And we also want to invite you to come up and pray with the elders uh, for anything that is on your heart. Finally, we ask you to invite you to join us for fellowship out in the foyer. We do need to clear out the sanctuary for our safety training and uh, uh, for our guests that are coming in in just a few minutes as well. It's, it's often said that Jesus was a friend of sinners. He didn't hang around everybody, but he, he did select uh, some specific ones. And I think he, he didn't pick his favorite sins to hang around but he was closest to those who were closest to their brokenness. Brokenness is not good. It is not good. But acknowledging our brokenness creates a window for Jesus to step into our lives. It's going to require change. It's going to require a hard look at ourselves. But that day is coming when our Father will meet us, and, and gladly so, because we we were willing to hate what he hates and love what he loves and embrace the path that Jesus has for us. Have a great day and don't, for look, don't forget to look for opportunities to celebrate people and discover God along the way. <laughs>